All right, uh, welcome to our third course in Astronomy 101. This is going to be Discovering the Universe Yourself, Part 2. So we kind of did a bit of an introduction last week. I'll go through that in a second. Um, the first thing, though, is I want to kind of mention what to look for in the sky as we're starting to get a little bit more used to seeing what's up there, understanding all these things. Um, the moon is going to be in its first quarter tonight. That will mean something to you after today. <laughs> and uh, then the summer triangle is also going to rise in the night sky. So shortly after dusk, um, I think looking east, yeah, you'll, you'll be able to see um, this big, it's not a constellation, but it's like the three brightest stars in a constel in, in three different constellations, um, Altair, Deneb, and Vega, you can see in a whole triangle. And as we will discuss today, you'll start to learn why that changes throughout the year um, as the Earth goes around the sun. If you are an observer, if you have a telescope, Jupiter is really great, um, sort of Sunday, Monday-ish. It rises in the early morning. It rises about midnight and then about three o'clock. It'll be up at its highest point and uh, really good for observing. And then it's going to be a um, waxing gibbous moon, which again, we will learn that terminology today. And uh, so it will be a full moon next week. All right. So without any sort of further ado there, um, let's get started. So last week we talked about um, constellations. Hey, Raj. And um, the constellations, remember, we always think of them like these images, right? We think of them like, you know, drawings in the sky from these bright star points. <laughs> hey, Brad. And... But what they really are is we do actually have defined constellations that are almost like states. Like we've broken up the sky into 88 different, you know, proportions throughout the sky. And those are our constellations that are indicated by these bright stars that form patterns. We talked a little bit about what our local sky is and how to define different points in it. So one being zenith, that's right above you when you go outside. The meridian is the line that goes from north to south through the zenith. And then the horizon is self-explanatory, but that's the horizon is where the sky meets the ground. Uh, we learned about azimuth and altitude. So azimuth is if you point, if you're trying to find something in the night sky with your local, um, in your local sky, you have its azimuth and you have its altitude. You start with the azimuth, point north, go clockwise until you hit that number of degrees, and then you go up the altitude to try to find that. We talked about angular sizes and distances. Remember, this was um, not how physically big or physically far away they are, but how many degrees they make up the night sky in. So we talked about different ways to measure that, and we're going to kind of come back to that, close that idea out the first part today. But remember, you can do like sort of one degree, sort of five degrees-ish, <laughs> 10 degrees, 20 degrees, um, that you can sort of go out into the sky and begin to start measuring sizes and distances as you look around. One of the things that we do is when you get really small beyond that, that's dividing degrees into arc minutes. There's 60 arc, arc minutes in a degree and then 60 arc seconds in every arc minute. So that's just a way to measure angular distances on a tiny, tiny level. So what we're going to do today, we have a lot to get through. So it'll probably spill over the half hour a little bit, but stick with me. I think um, there's some really awesome stuff. Talking about how the constellations change throughout the year. Remember, we talked about circumpolar stars, right? So these are the ones that never set. If you're looking up, if you can see the celestial pole, you'll see these stars kind of orbit that. And I'll pull up Stellarium after this slide so we can see those stars go around there. We talk about latitude and longitude on Earth. Now, that's probably familiar to some of you. You might know what your latitude and longitude is. Latitude is the one that does this. So it's zero degrees at the equator, and then it's up north and then south, and you get to 90 degrees north or 90 degrees south. And then your longitude is your east-west position. So you start at zero degrees. Sometimes they do east-west. Sometimes we go all the way around. But you're starting at zero degrees. And as Raj mentioned, he's uh, there in the UK, and um, that's where the prime meridian is, is in, um, well, it subtends the whole earth, but 
because the United Kingdom is further west into the ocean, um, that's actually a spot that we can um, draw the zero degree line, is the prime meridian on Earth. So I tried to explain this last week. It got a little chaotic, as is the case, always the case, about an hour after I stopped, I was like, oh yeah, that's how I should have explained it. <laughs> so I appreciate all your patience with me. Uh, but the key here is thinking that the altitude of the celestial pole in your sky is equal to your latitude. I showed it and then I failed epically to explain it. But think about it this way. If you're on the equator and you're looking north, you're basically like, trying to look up, you're not going to see the celestial pole. So the celestial pole is basically going to be like flat on your horizon because if you're on the equator, all the way down is going to be where the celestial pole is. So you're not going to see it. But the further up you go on the earth, that celestial pole will start to rise in the night sky. So when you get to 10 degrees, that celestial pole is now 10 degrees higher in the sky. Oh, thanks for the follow. And as you start to get higher, it's going to keep increasing and then obviously when you're at 90 degrees north it's going to be directly above you that sort of 90 degrees it's going to be at your zenith and so when it comes to navigating by the stars it's actually pretty easy to figure out your latitude if you can find the celestial pole which we have polaris it kind of marks out is the star that marks out the um, north celestial pole if you can figure out how high that is, and remember we learned this trick of, you know, 10 degrees, you can kind of mark up and then do that <laughs> and try to figure out how high it is, you can figure out your latitude. Longitude, on the other hand, is much, 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 much more difficult to figure out. Uh, if we get an opportunity to get into some more ancient astronomy type things, we can talk about how early navigators did actually figure out longitude, but it's very difficult to use the stars for that just because the Earth is rotating and that changes throughout the year. But latitude is very, very, very easy to, um, to figure out. And thank you, Andy. <laughs> like I said, I thought of it like about an hour after I left and I was like, oh, that makes so much sense. Um, so when it com comes to constellations, is there a official international constellations that everyone follows? Um, so each ancient, especially ancient cultures, but every storytelling culture has their own stories associated with the constellations that they see in the night sky. However, the International Astronomical Union did designate 88 regions of the sky that are named after these various stories um, that, that are an officially designated constellation. So thank you. All right. So let's go really quick into how to find the celestial pole. So we're pulling up Stellarium. Remember, this is free. You can play with this, especially this is great. If you don't really have a night sky that you can go look at, um, <laughs> you don't fail Todd, not at all. Now, uh, let's get rid of the atmosphere so we can see the stars and let's get rid of the ground. We're looking up North. This is Polaris. Um, if we we're able to measure it, if we were outside, you see it's about 34 degrees north. And um, we are in LA, which is 34 degrees latitude. Um, so how to find Polaris? Some of you might know this, some of you might not. Polaris is not the brightest star in the sky. That's serious. <laughs> not serious as in like, it's not the brightest star. It's not Sirius the dog, the Harry Potter character, <laughs> you, you understand. Um, but it is important because it is that North Celestial Pole. So uh, if you look over here, you might recognize this is the Big Dipper or the plow um, in the UK. And if you find sort of the last two points of the Big Dipper, you can align them and that will end up, the first sort of bright star that they hit is gonna be Polaris. And if we speed up time, you can see that it'll rotate around a little bit. Um, so you can see it's always kind of pointing at Polaris. So if you can find the Big Dipper, you can find those end two stars, they will point at Polaris. So um, that's how that works. Now, if we go to um, Australia, let's just go to Sydney, the Southern Hemisphere. Where that is, so we are here, 
let's look south because we're looking for the south celestial pole. Um, this one is a little bit trickier to find, but because we have fancy software, <laughs> we can speed it up and see where the stars are orbiting around. All right, there we go. I see it. All right, over here, we have the Southern Cross is right there. Now, so the Southern Cross will always point toward this sort of void that is about, <laughs> this perspective is really hard, but about where that South Celestial Pole is. Um, the thing is, is I, oh, there it is. Oh, that's why it was hard. All right, there's the Southern Cross. And what it is, is basically, if you are in the Southern Hemisphere, if you can find the Southern Cross, and you just see it and you don't have enough time to stay up late and watch like six hours of it go past. Um, it's essentially four cross lengths. So if you find the Southern Cross and you multiply it by four in the direction it's going, that's the South Celestial Pole. If you can measure up how high that is, then you're able to figure out what your latitude in the Southern Hemisphere is. So that's how you figure out your latitude. Again, if you're on the equator, the celestial poles are basically gonna be on the horizon. As you go up 10 degrees, it's gonna be easier to see them. And so it's gonna raise up 10 degrees as you're sort of moving up the side, it's gonna get higher and higher. And so if you can find that pole, see how high in the sky it is, what its azimuth is, that will be what your latitude is. Now, the night sky does change throughout the year. I mentioned at the top of the hour uh, that Todd missed. <laughs> Um, that the uh, summer triangle is now appearing in the northern hemisphere in the early night sky. And so the question is, well, why does the, why do the stars change depending on the time of the year? And it's because the earth is going around the sun, which seems obvious, but it's sometimes hard to think about why that actually would be. Now, let's just imagine kind of, eh, we're maybe about here a little bit. Um, we're going to be on daytime when we're on this side. And so we're not gonna be able to see any of the stars over in this direction because the stars over here will be up during the daytime. <laughs> That's uh, <laughs> people who know me know my love for Snape. <laughs> but aside from that, um, so when it's daytime over here, these stars, they're still in the sky, but the uh, sun is up, so it's, you, you we're not able to see them because of the atmosphere. When it's nighttime, um, we will be on this side facing away from the sun and we will see all of the stars over on this side. But if we go six months into, um, six months later, then all the stars over here that we did see during the night, we now can't see because it's daytime, but we can see all of the stars behind us because that's our nighttime there. Now, what we're doing here is uh, we did talk about the ecliptic plane. So we talked about the ecliptic plane last week where um, the sun, the path that the sun traces out as it goes throughout the year kind of behind us, how it's effectively moving. I talked about the fact that it's daytime here. The sun is at this point. That means it's right in front of this constellation. As it goes now, the sun is in front of this constellation and that changes throughout the year depending on where Earth is in its orbit. And you might recognize these um, constellations that these are the uh, these are the zodiac signs. And what they are is there is there is something to them. If you're able to kind of <laughs> I know, Becca, this is like the closest we actually get to astrology, but this is where the astrological signs come from, that there is something to them in the sense that they are the um, the constellations that make up that ecliptic plane that lay in the plane where the sun is in the night sky. So um, they, again, they change throughout the year and it's whichever one the sun is in front of that we can't see during the day um, because the sun is right in front of it. That's sort of that month's constellation. So yeah, there is, there is actually something, something to it. Um, now we're going to talk a little bit about seasons and then I'm going to come back to the zodiacs because there's something that kind of people always ask from an astrological standpoint that does have an effect here. But first, before we get to that, I want to talk about seasons. I touched on this a little bit, 
last week as sort of a bit of a preview, but the reason we have seasons on Earth is because our Earth is tilted. So if someone asks, why are there seasons? The answer is because the Earth is tilted. And how that causes seasons throughout the year has to do with the fact that the axis is always pointing in one direction. It's 23 and a half degrees off of the axis. And you can see it's always, as it's going around, um, it stays pointed in that direction. But what side is facing the sun changes throughout the year. So over here, let's just start in, in December. Um, the southern hemisphere, that part is tilted towards the sun. And what that does is because more of the southern hemisphere is getting uh, sunlight, their days are longer. You can see here that like if you're down here, it's going to rise uh, early and then you'll go through your day and you have a long day and it's going to set. Up here, this is our winter, and it's because our northern hemisphere is pointed away from the sun, so our days are shorter and it's cooler. And uh, our days are shorter, you can see it'll rise here, and then we have a shorter path before we're back in the night time again. Um, how that actually causes seasons, you might notice that, uh, you know, it takes, obviously, it's gradual. It's not you wake up and it's warm and then you uh, sometimes, well, whatever. <laughs> I used to live in Colorado, so seasons are kind of a what are seasons thing. Uh, they change by the day. But overall, as the earth is going through this process, um, for example, as it's moving into the winter season, it's starting to move further and further away, which just means that like up here, it's essentially cooling off. We're not getting as many... Uh, as much daylight, as much heat throughout, and so it just cools off a little bit more. And the same thing happens in the southern one. <laughs> yeah, thanks, Jewel. Exactly, it is true. Now, when we get to the equinox, that's when the axis is neither pointed towards nor away from the sun. So it's basically just perpendicular. You have the sun going this way, and the axis is tilted this way, and it doesn't really matter because it's just hitting this, the, um, this, half of the earth all equally, eh, equal, equinox, equal day and night. And then you get to the summer solstice where it's pointed towards the sun, the days are longer, it heats up, it's warmer, it's winter on the southern hemisphere, and then um, you get to our fall equinox. Again, these are these are pretty much the same. They're essentially, you know, day's still 24 hours and it's equal day and night. And uh, they just happen at different points. So how can you recognize the solstice and the equinox by the sun's motion in the sky? I said equinox equal night. That is, uh, it's because the sun rises exactly east and exactly west during the equinox. Um, so some of you may have seen pictures like there's, you know, ancient Stonehenge and, and different setups like that that are, that do align with these different points of the year. You can even see some really cool pictures of like, you know, big cities that have their streets aligned perfectly east and west. Uh, the equinox, you can see the sunrise and sunset directly down the road, which is really cool. And then um, the solstice is essentially when it's reached its furthest point, stops. Solstice is solstice, which means sun stopping. It stops and then it heads back. So it's basically the furthest for us, uh, the summer solstice is the furthest north the sun gets throughout its, you know, it rises every single day in a different position. It gets to its furthest north point and then it goes back. So it stops, turns around and goes back. And then in December, it's the opposite. So it gets, keeps rising further and further south and then it stops and it comes back. Um, I love these two images down here. So I mentioned a little bit last week as well. If you want homework assignments, one thing you can do is go outside in the same spot every day at um, sunrise or sunset and mark where the sun is rising and setting and you'll see it move throughout the year. So here is, a, um, is the equinox and then here is the summer solstice. So every single morning it's gonna be rising in different positions and then this is gonna be north. It'll go back, it'll come here and it'll go south. This picture, and Raj I, Raj, I see your question. I'll come back to it. This picture over here, the uh, an, anelima, <laughs> every time, 
is the shape that this does, but this person essentially went outside and they took a picture of the sun with a filter. Don't look directly at the sun. At the same time of day, in the same spot throughout the year. And this is how the position of the sun changed throughout that. So here is the equinox, here are the solstices. And this, if this is north, this would be the north, uh, the summer solstice. This would be the winter solstice. So Raj asked how many solstices are there? Uh, there are two. So there's a, we call it the summer and the winter solstice, which is pretty Northern hemisphere. It, it's not pretty. It is Northern hemisphere centric. That's just saying that that's the summer solstice is where the sun rises in the furthest north and then throughout the year it rises in the furthest south in the winter solstice. Um, and then it will start the cycle back again. And again, it just has to do with the fact that the Earth's axis is tilted. It's rising at a different point throughout the year and uh, as it goes around the sun. So um, if you are up in the northern hemisphere, if you get to the point where the Earth is tilted such that you are um, above what we call the Arctic Circle, the sun is never going to set. Um, if you're on the Arctic Circle, which is 23.5 degrees um, from the North Pole, you will not see the sunset. The sun will basically dip down, touch the horizon, and dip back up again. And that's just because we talked about those circumpolar stars. Remember the ones that kind of always, that never set, depending on where in on the earth you are, that determines kind of how many there are. That's essentially what's happening except with daylight. If you're up in the um, Arctic Circle, if you're over a certain point, as it goes from night to day, you're still going to be facing the sun and the sun is never going to totally set. So it's a pretty unique experience. Uh, I did live in Scotland for five years and even that it wasn't, near the Arctic Circle, but it was far north and days are long in the summer and short in the winter. You can really feel that uh, seasonal change a lot more than if you're down sort of in the mid latitudes. Um, but it's, it's beautiful and awesome. And if you came in a little bit late, I just wanted to say that we do have a lot of stuff that we're covering. So it's going to probably spill over. I try to aim for a half an hour. Um, yeah, it's 66.5 degrees north. I was trying to say it's 23 and a half degrees from the North Pole down, so that way up. <laughs> so thank you. It is, and I couldn't do the math fast enough in my head. It is 66.5 degrees north latitude, which is 20, 90 degrees minus 23.5. Math! <laughs> so thank you for mathing that for me, Andy. I appreciate that. Now, I'm going back to the zodiacs now. We've touched on how we go through throughout the year and then how the Earth's tilt on the axis affects us um, and how the motion of the sun moves throughout the sky. Um, <laughs> yeah, Saskatchewan, that's pretty far north, like 945 up to 445. Yeah, Scotland, we had probably like kind of about that, maybe 10 to 3 or 4, 334 ish. Short days. Um, now, some of you may have heard that your zodiac sign is not what it is. And so people always ask, like, what? I, I thought I knew maybe my zodiac sign isn't what I think it is, that it's shifted. And it kind of has. And there's a reason for that. This is bringing in the astronomy part. We talked about why we have um, these zodiac signs that they are the, the constellations that the sun is blocking at different points of the year. But the Earth's tilted, and it's not a perfect sphere. It's a little bit flattened. So it's effectively round for us tiny humans to care about. But for physics and angular momentum to care about, it's a little bit flat. Because of that, and because it's tilted, it's going to wobble. So it's going to process. That means that its axis, the tilt, isn't going to change, but where it's pointed is going to change over a long cycle. So for our axis, we have the Earth. It's pointed about that way. To actually go around like this, to go around once, it's going to be 26,000 years to do one full cycle around. Like I said, it doesn't change the tilt, it just changed where that pole is pointing in the sky. 
So in a thousand, two thousand years ish, we'll start rotating a little bit away from Polaris, such that we don't really have a polar uh, celestial pole star to look at. Yeah, obloid, obloid spheroid. So fun and difficult to say. <laughs> yeah, Jewel, I know. <laughs> um, but because of that, right? Recall, and this isn't. This takes just a little bit of like a breath and a focus to wrap our heads around. But just recall here, this is June, right? So this is our summer solstice. So here, I'm trying to do it, whatever. I can't make it point in the direction here because brain, um, but I can do this. So here, the um, axis is pointed in this direction. So it's pointed away from us, but that determines our um, summer stol solstice. This is the point where it's pointed the furthest away. As our axis starts to process, that is going to be such that maybe here it's going to be pointed the furthest, furthest away. Again, doesn't necessarily matter on our lifetimes, but it does matter what um, constellation is blocking this. And actually, so you're wondering why in the few thousand years our calendars haven't changed. Our accounting for leap year kind of starts to account for this. Like that's why it's not perfect because we're accounting for the fact that there's a little bit extra just from the procession um, that does progress our months properly. Again, in your lifetime, you're not really going to, you're not going to notice it, but it's enough that in 2000 years, we've kind of progressed from summer being here to like the summer solstice from being here to being here which meant that uh, the constellation that the sun is blocking has slightly shifted almost one full sign. So when you hear that your zodiac sign isn't what it originally was, that's because they were originally sort of assigned uh, 2000 years ago and it's kind of shifted since then. So because of the precession of Earth's axis. Pause. Don't stress too much about it because it is a lot of sort of angles and things to picture, but take your time, maybe come back to this and just try to think about how if Earth's axis is slowly doing this as it's going around the sun, it's going to change where it's pointed every time we go. So carrying on from that, um, let's talk a little bit about the moon. So we've talked about how constellations and everything change in the night sky. Um, we're going to talk about the moon. Now, this is uh, just putting the scale of the Earth to the moon to the sun. <laughs> I love this image. Space is big. Things are far apart from each other. This is if we took the size of the Earth relative to the sun and the moon and the distance between them, that's about how far it is. Um, space is big. The sun is very, very big. <laughs> um, let's talk a little bit about what we see when we are looking at the sun in the night sky. Because that sun is so much bigger ratio wise and covers the whole orbit, the reason that that kind of matters and the reason we show that is because it basically says that the sun rays are going to hit the earth and the moon from the same direction, that we're being hit all by the same stuff. Because if you look at this, it's all just coming and hitting us. Now. These lunar phases, you can see, we define lunar phases as the moon's appearance in the sky changing as the position relative to the sun changes. Uh, the moon orbits the earth every 29 and a half days. And you can see here, the sunlight is coming from this direction and it's hitting the moon and the earth on the same, same side. I've got some good graphics that are going to help us start to understand how the moon's phases work. Essentially, we have um, the moon takes about 29 and a half days to make it all the way around. So this is sort of sped up and you can see Earth is going through day night cycles. So every night you're seeing sort of a slightly different phase of the moon. Sun is coming from over here and the moon is going around the Earth and the full cycle takes 29 and a half days. 
as that happens, we see different lunar phases. The different names that we call them is uh, we have new and full moons. New moon is essentially when we don't see any light being reflected from the moon. It's effectively between, it is between the earth and the sun. So we're not seeing any light reflected. What we see when we see phases is we're seeing light being reflected back to us. The moon isn't giving off any light itself. It's reflecting sunlight from whatever side is being hit by it and coming back to us. And earth is rotating much faster than the moon is going around. So we all see the same phase every single night. It just changes from day to day to day. Now, um, as it goes through its cycle, it then goes to a crescent moon. This is what we call a waxing crescent. Waxing means it's bigger and a crescent moon, it, you know, forms a crescent, a croissant, but it, um, so it's, it's basically less than half is what we call a crescent moon. Then we get to a first quarter moon that you say it's a first quarter because when we talk about a cycle, we go new moon to first quarter to full moon to third quarter. So this is the cycle, the order that we talk about them in. So first quarter means it's still getting bigger. It's just halfway. Um, waxing gibbous, remember waxing means the light is growing night to night to night. The light is starting to, in, is increasing every single night. And now it's more than half. And that's what we call a gibbous moon. Then we get to a full moon. That's when it's on the other side. Light is hitting it here, bouncing off and hitting us back. And we basically see it throughout the night because it's right opposite to the sun. So when the sun sets, the moon rises and it's a full moon. Then we get, it's still a gibbous moon because it's more than half, but now we call it a waning gibbous moon. Waning because it's getting less every single night. Um, less of the moon is being illuminated. So we have our waning gibbous moon. Then we have our third quarter moon. And then we have our waning crescent moon. Um, again, it's showing kind of from the perspective here. So I don't want to get too hung up on like where the sun is coming versus where here is. Because you have to think about where night is as we're going throughout. Now, I honestly can say that I learned the most about lunar phases by just paying attention to them by myself. <laughs> honestly, honestly, not even looking up what it is, but just when I see the moon making a mental note of what phase it's in, trying to think about where it might be going and, um, and trying to, you know, just kind of think through it. One of the things to keep in mind is the, er, uh, the sun rises and sets in the east and the west. When you see the moon in the night sky, on a single day, it's going to rise in the east and set in the west because that's the earth rotating. <laughs> so the moon is going to rise and set uh, in the east to the west. But day to day, the moon is going to move in the opposite direction. So all you have to think about is, okay, think about your east-west. If you see the moon in the sky and you see what phase it's in and you can see kind of, you know, kind of where the sun is based on rising and setting and the angle that it's hitting the moon and then hitting us, the next night the moon is going to move slightly further in the opposite direction. So if the sun is over here, that means more sunlight is going to be hitting it. More sunlight's going to hit it. More sunlight's going to hit it. So it's waxing. It's getting more. Um, that's why you can kind of pay attention to these rising and set times and try to think about that relative to sunrise and sunset. Like I said, it's going to get a lot easier to wrap your head around just by observing it. So Becca has a question. Is there a significance or benefit to the rotation direction of the Earth and Moon being the same? Any Earth-like planets out there have opposing rotations? And what would be different on the planet because of that? Or is it just a clue? That's a great question. So when they've all kind of um, formed at the same time, we will get into solar system formation. But just really quickly, 
If it's all orbiting in the same direction and in the same plane, that's a good indicator that they all formed at the same time. If something is rotating in an opposite direction or it's not in the same plane of rotation as the rest of the solar system or the planets, then that's a good indication that it was captured or formed after the fact by some other phenomenon. So that's kind of a short answer to that, but that's, um, yeah, we'll get more into solar system formation, but that's a great question. Now it's important to note too that we always see the same side of the moon and kind of with Becca's question, um, we'll talk about why that is the case later. We'll talk about what tidal locking is and how the gravity has an effect on it. But for now, just picture the fact that we always see the same side of the moon. Um, you can see that this is a great image here. Um, thank you, NASA, <laughs> for providing these. Um, but the arrow here is pointing towards, it's basically just the same point on the moon, and you can see it's always facing the same point on Earth. And if you're having a hard time wrapping your head around this, just imagine that you were here on the moon, and this is your path throughout the month you would always be sort of seeing the earth in the same spot in the sky. Now it would be different phases that you're exper experiencing and different points where the sun is hitting you, but you would always be facing the same direction. Um, and that's what we call synchronous rotation. You can think about it too if you had a ball on a table we would go around and you want to go around the ball and you keep facing it the whole time, that's synchronous rotation. But you would be making a full circle as you're facing that ball the whole time. And that's effectively what's going on here. You can see the moon is rotating, but it's rotating with its rotation. So the tidal locking, we will get into. I hate to do the, that sort of spoilery thing and not just explain it now. If we have time at the end, I'll explain it but that has to do with its formation and Earth's gravity when it was being formed. And uh, that is tidal locking, is the physics sort of, the astrophysics phenomenon that has, synchronous rotation is like any rotating bodies that are doing this. Tidal locking has to do with the gravitational forces that cause synchronous rotation. So, so we talked a little bit about full moons and new moons. That means that they're between, you know, the earth is between the sun and the um, moon or the moon is between the earth and the sun. So why aren't there eclipses every time there's a full moon or every time there's a new moon? The reason for that is that moon's orbit is slightly inclined, only by five degrees. But that means that um, most of the time when we have a new moon or a full moon, it's actually going to be not directly in between us. Um, now it's slight but it means that there's not gonna be an eclipse. The nodes are what we talk about. If you do exactly what this is showing, you have a, basically a piece of paper with the sun-earth orbit, and then you have a piece of paper with the earth-moon orbit. The points where they meet are what we call the nodes, and when the nodes all align, that's when you get these eclipses that happen. Uh, so we have lunar eclipses. That's when the earth is directly between the sun and the moon. So basically Earth's shadow covers the moon. And then a solar eclipse is when the moon is between the sun and the Earth. And that's when the moon's shadow gets cast onto the Earth. So what you see there. Um, there are two different types of shadows. We call them the umbra and the penumbra. This is like a full shadow and this is a partial shadow. And it just has to do with the light rays that are coming off. So when they're combined, when the shadow's combined, you get this umbra. And when it's just kind of half of the light rays are hitting over here, that's a penumbra. And that results in different types of eclipses. With lunar eclipses, it's the same thing. You have these light rays that come from the sun. Ones that kind of come down this way is going to create this umbra. And the ones that kind of keep going up this way, you're going to get this penumbra, this partial shadow here. Now, um, a total lunar eclipse is when it's fully in the umbra of Earth's shadow. A partial eclipse is when the moon is sitting between the umbra and the penumbra. <laughs> so that's where you're seeing this. This isn't sort of sitting out here. This is actually sitting where there's a full shadow versus a slightly lighter shadow. And then when there's a lunar eclipse with a penumbra, it's just slightly dimmed. 
So it's not going to be like this full shadow that's going on. And what's happening here, don't have to get too much into the physics of it because I'm already way over where I wanted to be, but what's happening here is it's basically getting just a massive sunset. Uh, we're seeing a reflection. All that light is being bent through the atmosphere on Earth, hitting the moon and then getting bounced back to us. So it is like a baller sunset on the moon right there. <laughs> you get to see through the uh, through that. Oh, that's awesome. Super jealous. I've never seen a solar eclipse. So that's my, my big failing as an astrophysicist. The different types of solar eclipses are similar. You get a total solar eclipse, I know, when you're within the umbra. You get a partial solar eclipse when it's in between them. And then you get an annular eclipse, basically because it's because moon's orbit around the Earth also isn't perfectly circular. There's points where it's closer and points where it's further away. If there's a solar eclipse when the moon is slightly further away, then you can see here its umbra is going to hit its point, and then it's going to keep going. So you basically missed this shot here, and you're going to see part of the sun kind of around it there. <laughs> oh, thanks. Now you can predict eclipses because of this behavior, the combination of the nodes and the earth going around and then the, you know, the lunar cycle and everything. And it's about like 18 years and 11 days. You get this cycle that starts and it's called the Saros cycle. And you can map out where all of these. So the ones that Becca and Andy are talking about, that was the 2017 that passed right through the United States. Um, there was one in 2019 that went through Chile and uh, lots and another one that's going to be in 2020 in December. Um, so you can mark those all out and you can actually see those. Um, you can predict those eclipses. It's complicated. These are solar eclipses. It's complicated because of that combination of nodes and distances and, and angles and all the different orientations that you have to get, but it's repeatable. And ancient cultures were able to actually predict these eclipses. Now, just to close out, there is an awesome trivia fact. It's one of my favorite trivia facts of all time. There was a battle called, and its nickname is the Battle of the Eclipse. And it was from the Medes and the Lydians, and which is, is kind of Turkey-ish. And it was essentially in the 6th century BCE. And what happened was they had been fighting a six-year war, and there was a battle going on and a solar eclipse happened and it got dark. And for those of you who have experienced it, you know how kind of ethereal and super creepy it is. So it freaked them out and they literally laid down their weapons and signed a treaty that day because they thought that the gods were upset with them, which is understandable when in the middle of the day, the sky just gets dark <laughs> for a couple minutes. And uh, they date because it happened, we know roughly where they were and we know roughly when this war was happening you know it's a six-year war so it was a good period of time and cultures were you know documenting stuff during this time we we're able to date that because there was a solar eclipse happening and you saw on this map they are very precise in where they fall sort of year to year so if you say oh i saw a solar eclipse in 2019 in the Southern Hemisphere, you're going to be like, oh, okay, well, then you were here or here. You know, you can really narrow it down. And so because of that, we are able to precisely date when this treaty was signed. And it's probably the first completely accurate date to the day uh, is May 28th, 585 BCE is when these this war ended and the treaty was signed due to a solar eclipse, which I love. So thank you, Penny. It is super cool. Hi, if you're watching this, you're watching our live stream after it has already aired. Uh, we are saving the Q&A for those taking part in the live stream because it can get a bit random and all over the place and in the very best way that we all know and love. So um, please leave your questions down below. Thank you so much for watching and for being here. Please don't forget to subscribe and click the little bell so you get notifications when videos are posted. And if you are able, please consider hopping over to the Twitch stream on Fridays at 1 p.m.
Pacific time so you can take part in the Q&A as well. But thank you for being here and live long and prosper.